Campbell is our next speaker, so we look forward to hearing your talk. All right. So today, uh, my talk will be on God's hidden mercy in the midst of creation's predation. So in the West, we often view uh, predation as an unnecessary source of suffering in God's good creation. We see this popularized popularized notions of suffering in nation, nature through uh, uh, writings like Richard Dawkins. He said, if nature were kind, she would at least make the minor concession of anesthetizing caterpillars before they are eaten alive from within. But nature is neither kind nor unkind. She is neither against suffering nor for it. Nature is not interested one way or the other in suffering unless it affects the survival of DNA. It is easy to imagine that a gene, say, tranquilizes gazelles when they are able, about to suffer a killing bite. Would such a gene be favored by natural selection? Not unless the act of tranquilizing a gazelle improved that gene's chances of being propagated into future generations. It is hard to see why this should be so, and we may therefore guess that gazelles suffer horrible pain and fear when they are pursued to the death. So this leads to two claims we will examine today. The first claim is that if nature were kind, she would at least make the minor concession of anesthetizing caterpillars before they are being they are eaten alive from within. This leads to the question, how is pain perceived and is the perception of pain present across all species? There's also a second claim here that creatures like gazelles suffer horrible pain and fear when they are pursued to the death. And it leads to the question, does nature provide pain suppression and or a tranquilizing effect before death? So in uh, the, the scientific literature, for example, this article, Do Insects Feel Pain? Uh, we find that no example is known to us of an insect showing protective behavior towards injured body parts such as limping after leg injury or declining to feed or mate because of general abdominal injuries. On the contrary, our experience has been that insects will continue with normal activities even after severe injury or removal of body parts. Insects show no immobilization of equivalent to the mammalian reaction to painful body damage. Yet atheists still use examples of insect pain to claim that God is responsible for unnecessary suffering. So, and this is despite the fact that the scientific literature has been disputing their claims for over 40 years. You'll notice this, this article alone was from the, uh, 1984. So we need to talk about nociception and pain. Um, nociception is the reflective response of peripheral, peripheral nervous system uh, to the noxious stimuli. So bacteria can exhibit this, but you and I can also exhibit this. For example, if we were to touch a hot stove, we have a quick nociceptive response, a reflective response where our hand jerks back from the hot stove far before our brain comprehends, ow, I just burned my finger, that really hurt. Uh, instead, so nociception is very quick. It's a quick response for humans between the nerve ending and the, the spinal cord and sends a message very quickly back to the, the, the peripheral system. In contrast, pain is comprised, and this is according to the International Association for the Study of Pain and also the U.S. Academy of Sciences, uh, pain is a combination of sensory aspect and a distressing aspect. And the sensory aspect of pain perception tells you where in the, the body there is an injury or, or, or some sort of discomfort. And the distressing aspect refers to the psychological response to that injury or harmful stimuli. So according to the US National Academy of Sciences publication, Recognition and Alleviation of Pain in Laboratory Animals, invertebrates like insects experience nociception but not the psychological distress associated with the perception known as pain. While pain discrimination experiments may eventually demonstrate the psychologically distressing aspect of pain in other vertebrates, current empirical support of psychological distress is only strong in mammals and birds. So this is to say, when we look at this again, pain is comprised of two sensations simultaneously. One is the sensory aspect where you could tell there's something wrong. So all Vertebrates can locate there is a harmful stimuli uh, somewhere in their body and where it is and what it feels like. But right now, the evidence only strongly shows this distressing aspect in mammals and birds. So we're going to discuss this actually looking at a brain 
here. This is a human brain, uh, the two aspects of, of pain. So first we're gonna talk about the somatosensory cortex and the, the posterior insula. So if you wanna kind of get an idea where this is, if you put your, your hand on the top back part of your, your head, the parietal region, that's where you would have this sensory aspect that tells you the location of the injury. So you have a, a, a cut on your knee, you have a burn on your finger, you have a blister on your foot. This tells you the location and what type of injury. In contrast, in the frontal lobe, so if you put your hand on the front of your head so that your pinky is approximately where your hairline would be, then that's where your anterior cingulate cortex would be. And that gives you the, the emotional response. You wanna cry when you have this distressing aspect to the injury, it's psychological. And we have to realize that we are taking, we conflate these two separate brain perceptions into one experience that we call pain. Okay, but when we look at vertebrate brain physiology, when we look at this sensory aspect, that is something that fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals can all detect. They all experience that. However, there's that frontal lobe only, or the equivalent only in birds and mammals. And that's where they demonstrate and experience the psychologically dis distressing aspect to what we know as pain. So we see this, that without pain's warning system, the reptile, uh, reptiles easily get burned. For example, we see that, um, you know, there's lots of reptiles that have heating lamps. One of the most common injuries that veteran, veterinarians see are these burns on the reptiles because they will perch so close to the heat lamp that they burn their flesh and yet they don't respond to the injury. It's like they do not, this suggests that they do not perceive pain. So the distressing aspect of pain for mammals and birds, it turns out this is important for when we look at predation because this same region that perceives pain also has the highest density of opioid receptors in the brain. The reason this is significant is because opioids block pain perception. So when we look go out to nature, we see that fear even though we don't like it, it creates an adrenal response which causes stress-induced analgesia. Analgesia is pain block, okay, a pain block. So um, we have to realize that even though fear is unpleasant, it focuses the creature's attention on the danger and survival. A major part of what makes feelings of fear so unpleasant is the corresponding cascade of stress hormones from the adrenal system that prepares the creature's body for survival when in danger. The cortisol prepares the body to flee or fight by flooding it with glucose. As the cortisol constricts the arteries, epinephrine increases the heart rate and together those two mechanisms cause the blood to pump harder and faster. And there's many other physiological changes that the creature is undergoing that are not necessarily pleasant, but they are preparing them to to fight or, or flee. However, one of the most important here is there's also the flooding of endogenous opioids. Endogenous means that those are, op those are opioids that are in, uh, created from within the body of the creature. So they are naturally present, they are available, and they are released during the uh, adrenal response, which suppresses pe pain perception in the animal allowing the creature to focus on escaping from danger. And this is why it's called stress-induced analgesia. So we have pain suppression during a predator attack. This means that, we, and we have to realize that as we're observers at home watching on National Geographic or Blue Planet, safely at home, our bodies are in a completely different physiological state than the prey animal on the TV. That animal we see, the, the antelope, its brain is flooded with those opioids. And what that's doing is that is blocking the perception of pain. So it is able to get away, fight, or even if it's killed, it will mitigate any pain perception that it has during that experience because those, those opioids are stronger than morphine. And so we can see an example of that by looking at an example of human prey experience during a shark attack. So while swimming off the coast with lifeguards for a life-saving training, Ahmad Hassiam saw a large shark fin darting through the water. And he says, I was face-to-face -face with a 15-foot great white. 
I touched the shark with my feet to try to push myself away, but that only sent it into a frenzy. It swung its body around, making a colossal splash. It was nearly on me now, and my instinct was to somehow get on top of it. I tried desperately to push myself up, but for some reason, my right leg wouldn't move. I looked down and saw why. Everything below my knee was in the shark's mouth. By now, I was dangling in, against the side of the shark's body, out of breath and in shock. Then it took me underwater, still shaking me with my leg in its mouth. I could feel my body moving further from its mouth as its teeth slid down the bone towards my ankle. I gave one last enormous push, enormous push and heard a great snapping sound. Suddenly, I was free. And he, get, he was pulled into a boat and he says, I didn't know it, but halfway down my shin, there was nothing left. So here is an example where we're seeing stress-induced uh, analgesia it's opioid pain blockage. The shark attack gives us the perspective of the prey animal when under attack by a predator. Akhmat's sighting of the shark fin initiates the fear event that begins the corresponding adrenal response and is stress-induced analgesia. Consequently, moments later when the, sharks, the shark attacks, he will not feel pain from the event. When Akhmat tries to get on top of the shark, he's surprised he can't and doesn't know why his leg won't, right leg won't move. He must look down to visually ascertain that his leg is clenched in the teeth of the shark, which implies he cannot feel any pain from the, the, the bite. Notice that his somatosensory cortex is working, telling him the location of his leg, but his interior cingulate cortex is suppressed by endogenous opioids, so he is not able to feel any pain associated with the injury. The analgesia effect is so strong that he breaks his own leg in one enormous push to free himself. His natural pain suppression is so great that Akhmat doesn't realize that halfway down his shin, there is nothing left of his leg. So we also have to remember, besides the fact that the, the prey animal is having their, their pain suppressed by opioids, predators selectively target those creatures that would otherwise suffer. Numerous studies have verified that predators preferentially hunt the weak, the injured, the sickly. Otherwise, those that would be, uh, that would most likely to otherwise suffer. So contrary to what atheists like Richard Dawkins claim, nature is kind and has limited the psychologically distressing aspect of pain to more highly developed species, specifically mammals and birds. Nature has provided something better than a tranquilizing effect by blocking pain perception, even while enabling the creature to fight or flee during the opioid flooded adrenal response. And God's predators reduce unnecessary suffering in God's good creation. And with that, hopefully we'll have some time to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We do. We have about seven minutes left for questions. So my question is, is this, would you consider the uh, reflex, the nociceptor re reflex, uh, which occurs in less time than it occurs for the somatosensory uh, sensation of pain to be some way considered uh, uh, God's uh, sensitivity to the process. In other words, you're going to you're going to respond to the the adverse stimuli before you feel it. Yes, like yes. Um, and 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 I would say so. You're you're talking like for mammals and birds, but I would say also nociception is available even down to bacteria right. because God wants every creature to have a, a good shot at surviving and, and, and having offspring and stuff. So yes, um, but for human beings and, and other creatures that can have a, a response to that, that automatic signal is a lot faster. Like I'm trying to remember, it was in a nursing uh, journal uh, article, but actually it was at like 300 meters per second is how fast that, that message from the fingertip to the spinal cord and back was. Um, so that's a much faster response than getting it to the brain. And then because you could do a lot of damage if you don't move quickly. Does that answer your question, Carlos? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. This has bothered me my whole Christian life thinking, <laughs> how could predation be of God? And I, I've been, I'm 66. I've been looking at this answer for 45 years and you answered my question. I thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I, you know, that's one of the reasons I love ASA. I think more scientists have to do that route where we do science first and then go into theology because so often our answers are trying to come from philosophers 
and theologians that are, are afraid to look at journal articles like those you see on your screen. Uh, yes, Victoria, thank you. Uh, very interesting. And I hope uh, this will uh, th this shed some, a lot of light on some of the recent discoveries about that even experiments showing that flies perceive pain. But, a, a, but as you say, this is not, uh, not in the, the way we experience pain. Uh, I wonder how this relates, though, to the chronic needless pain that a lot of humans uh, experience and uh, how it also relates to the opioid epidemic, which apparently was triggered by people who have a lot of pain and can't uh, suppress it. That is a great question. And that's actually the second half of my thesis. But this is really the, the first part. This is dealing with the problem of predators. And it's a, both a blessing and a curse that predators don't come and eat us to put us out of our misery. But then we have the, the downside of, well, then what do we do when we have chronic pain? What do we ha do when we have social pain? Here's the, 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 the answer in a nutshell. Turns out that for, for mammals and birds and obviously humans, we also have another mechanism for releasing those natural opioids. And that's from empathetic relationships. When you sit and listen to a friend that's in chronic pain talk about how they're feeling and you're th physically present with them, you are releasing those natural opioids in their frontal lobe. And so this goes exactly to what you're talking about. Notice how society is kind of, we don't have extended families. We, we're busy working, we're on our phones, screens, we aren't giving face time. So we are not re naturally reducing, uh, releasing those opioids as we should. So people are in much more pain than we have been in previous generations, not because we can't get rid of the pain, but because we don't have the social relationships that would reduce those. So I guess that's, that goes to the, the, health, the opioid crisis. When we don't get it from healthy relationships, we take artificial opioids to try to compensate and bury that pain. Thank so you. That's, my wife's a pastoral counselor, so she'll appreciate that. Okay, yeah. I had I had a quick one. This is Ryan. Um, Go ahead, Ryan. You, you kind of touched on it a little bit there, Vicky. But I'm curious if you if you've thought um, about non-human animals' capacity to suffer when it's not induced by the pain pathway. Um, I, I'm a mammal person, so I think about examples among elephants and whales where it seems like the death of an individual that leads them to grieve. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you've looked into what's happening neurologically there in those types of animals. Yes, that's in the second half of my thesis. And so again, that's a most like, so when I showed you that frontal lobe, and I talked about pain perception there, we tend to think of that that's going to light up when you get a physical injury. But that part also uh, lights up when we grieve, when we're in emotional pain, social pain, someone we love, we've lost that frontal lobe lights up also. So it doesn't matter whether it's a broken body or a broken relationship that causes physical pain, even if it's emotional suffering. So mammals and birds can feel that, but you also see in nature that they mitigate one another's pain by these social empathetic interactions. They vocalize to one another, they have physical contact, they groom one another. There's all different ways they do it. Human beings do it by verbalizing to one another, but also they can do it by physical touch. But yes, so the same mechanism works in other species that can feel this social emotional pain. Thanks, Vicki. Well, thank you, Vicki, for that um, presentation. Yeah.